Section 17 of Astounding Stories, 7th of July, 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Dixon. Astounding Stories, 7th July, 1930, by Various. The Power and the Glory, by Charles W. Diffin. There were papers on the desk, a litter of papers scrawled over in the careless writing of indifferent students, with the symbols of chemistry and long mathematical computations. The man at the desk pushed them aside to rest his lean, lined face on one thin hand. The other arm, ending at the wrist, was on the desk before him. Students of a great university had long since ceased to speculate about the missing hand, the result of an experiment they knew, a hand that was a mass of lifeless cells, amputated quickly that the living arm might be saved. But that was some several years ago, ancient history to those who came and went through Professor Edinger's classroom. And now Professor Edinger was weary, weary and old, he told himself, as he closed his eyes to shut out the sight of the interminable papers and the stubby wrist that had ended forever his experiments, and the delicate manipulations which only he could do. He reached slowly for a buzzing phone, but his eyes brightened at the voice that came to him. I've got it! I've got it! The words were almost incoherent. This is Avery, Professor. Avery! You must come at once. You will share in it. I owe it all to you. You will be the first to see. I'm sending a taxi for you. Professor Edinger's tired eyes crinkled to a smile. Enthusiasm like this was rare among his youngsters, but Avery, with the face of a poet, a dreamer's eyes and the mind of a scientist. Good boy, Avery. A long time since he had seen him, had him in his own laboratory for two years. What's this all about? he asked. No, no, said a voice. I can't tell you. It's too big. Greater than the induction motor. Greater than the electric light. It is the greatest thing in the world. The taxi should be there now. You must come. A knock at the office door where a voice said, Car for Professor Edinger. Confirm the excited words. I'll come, said the professor. Right away. He pondered as the car whirled him across the city on what this greatest thing in the world might be, and he hoped with gentle scepticism that the enthusiasm was warranted. A young man opened the car door as they stopped. His face was flushed, Edinger noted, hair pushed back in disarray, his shirt torn open at the throat. Wait here he told the driver, and took the professor by the arm to hurry him into a dilapidated building. "'Not much of a laboratory,' he said, "'but we'll have better, you and I. We'll have better.' The room seemed bare with its meagre equipment, but it was neat, as became the best student of Professor Edinger. Rows of reagent bottles stood on the shelves, but the tables were a litter of misplaced instruments and broken glassware, where trembling hands had fumbled in heedless excitement. "'Glad to see you again, Avery.' The gentle voice of Professor Edinger had lost its tired tone. It's been two years you've been working, I judge. Now what is this great discovery, boy? What have you found? The younger man, in whose face the colour came and went, and whose eyes were shining from dark hollows that marked long days and sleepless nights, still clung to the other's arm. It's real, he said. It's great. It means fortune and fame. And you're in on that, Professor. The old master he said, and clapped a hand affectionately upon a thin shoulder. I owe it all to you, and now I have... I have learned... No, no, you shall see for yourself. Wait. He crossed quickly to a table. On it was an apparatus. The eyes of the older man widened as he saw it. It was intricate, a maze of tubing. There was a glass bulb above, the generator of a cathode ray, obviously, and electromagnets below and on each side. Beneath was a crude sphere of heavy lead, a retort, it might be, and from this there passed two massive insulated cables. The understanding eyes of the professor followed them, one to a terminal on a great insulating block upon the floor, the other to a similarly protected terminal of carbon some feet above it in the air. The trembling fingers of the young man made some few adjustments, then he left the instrument to take his place by an electric switch. Stand back, he warned, and closed the switch. There was a gentle hissing from within glass tubes, the faint glow of a blue-green light, and that was all until, 
with a crash like the ripping crackle of lightning a white flame arced between the terminals of the heavy cables it hissed ceaselessly through the air where now the tang of ozone was apparent the carbon blocks glowed with a brilliant incandescence when the flame ceased with the motion of a hand where avery pulled a switch the man's voice was quiet now you do not know yet what you have seen but there is a tremendous potential there an amperage i can't measure with my limited facilities he waved a deprecating hand about the ill-furnished laboratory but you have seen his voice trembled and failed at the forming of the words the disintegration of the atom said professor edinger quietly and the release of power unlimited did you use thorium he inquired the other looked at him in amazement then i should have known you would understand he said humbly and you know what it means again his voice rose power without end to do the work of the world great vessels driven a lifetime on a mere ounce of matter a revolution in transportation in living he paused the liberation of mankind he added and his voice was reverent this will do the work of the world it will make a new heaven and a new earth oh i have dreamed dreams he exclaimed i have seen visions and it has been given to me me to liberate man from the curse of adam the sweat of his brow i can't realize it even yet i i am not worthy he raised his eyes slowly in the silence to gaze in wondering astonishment at the older man there was no answering light no exultation on the lined face only sadness in the tired eyes that looked at him and through him as if focused upon something in a dim future or past don't you see asked the wondering man the freedom of men the liberation of a race no more poverty no endless grinding labor his young eyes too were looking into the future a future of blinding light culture he said instead of heartbreaking toil a chance to grow mentally spiritually it is another world a new life and again he asked surely you see i see said the other i see plainly the new world said avery it it dazzles me it rings like music in my ears i see no new world was the slow response the young face was plainly perplexed don't you believe he stammered after you have seen i thought you would have the vision would help me emancipate the world save it his voice failed men have a way of crucifying their saviors said the tired voice the inventor was suddenly indignant you're blind he said harshly it is too big for you and i would have had you stand beside me in the great work i shall announce it alone there will be laboratories enormous and factories my invention will be perfected simplified compressed a generator will be made thousands of horsepower to do the work of a city free thousands of men made so small you can hold it in one hand the sensitive face was proudly alight proud and a trifle arrogant the exultation of his coming power was strong upon him yes said professor edinger in one hand and he raised his right arm that he might see where the end of a sleeve was empty i am sorry said the inventor abruptly i didn't mean but you will excuse me now there is so much to be done but the thin figure of professor edinger had crossed to the far table to examine the apparatus there crude he said beneath his breath crude but efficient in the silence a rat had appeared in the distant corner the professor nodded as he saw it the animal stopped as the man's eyes came upon it then sat squirrel-like on one of the shelves as it ate a crumb of food some morsel from a hurried lunch of avery's the professor reflected poor avery yes there was much to be done he spoke as much to himself as to the man who was now beside him it enters here he said and peered downward toward the lead bulb he placed a finger on the side of the metal about here i should think have you a drill and a bit of quartz the inventor's eyes were puzzled but the assurance of his old instructor claimed obedience 
he produced a small drill and a fragment like broken glass. And he started visibly as the one hand worked awkwardly to make a small hole in the side of the lead. But he withdrew his own restraining hand, and he watched in mystified silence while the quartz was fitted to make a tiny window, and the thin figure stooped to sight as if aiming the opening towards a far corner where a brown rat sat upright in the earnest munching of a dry crust. The professor drew Avery with him as he retreated noiselessly from the instrument. "'Will you close the switch?' he whispered. The young man hesitated, bewildered at this unexpected demonstration, and the professor himself reached with his one hand for the black lever. Again the ark crashed into life, to hold for a brief instant until Professor Edinger opened the switch. "'Well?' demanded Avery. "'What's all the show? Do you think you're teaching me anything?' "'About my own instrument?' "'There was hurt pride and jealous resentment in his voice. "'See,' said Professor Edinger quietly, "'and his one thin hand pointed to a far shelf, "'where in the shadow was a huddle of brown fur and a bit of crust. "'It fell as they watched, "'and the plop of the soft body upon the floor "'sounded loud in the silent room. "'The law of compensation,' said Professor Edinger, Two sides to the medal, darkness and light, good and evil, life and death. The young man was stammering. What do you mean? A death ray evolved? And what of it? he demanded. What of it? What's that got to do with it? A death ray, the other agreed. You have dreamed, Avery. One must in order to create, but it is only a dream. You dreamed of life, a fuller life, for the world. But you would have given them, as you have just seen, death. The face of Avery was white as wax. His eyes glared savagely from dark hollows. A rat! he protested. You have killed a rat, and you say, you say! He raised one trembling hand to his lips to hold them from forming the unspeakable words. A rat, said the professor, or a man or a million men. We will control it. All men will have it, the best and the worst, and there is no defense. It will free the world. It will destroy it. No! And the white-faced man was shouting now. You don't understand. You can't see. The lean figure of the scientist straightened to its full height. His eyes met those of the younger man, silent now before him, but Avery knew the eyes never saw him. They were looking far off, following the wings of thought. In the stillness the man's words came harsh and commanding. "'Do you see the cities?' he said. "'Crumbling to ruins under the cold stars, the fields, they are rank with wild growth, torn and gullied by the waters, a desolate land where animals prowl, and the people, the people!' Wandering bands, lower as the years drag on, than the beasts themselves. The children dying, forgotten, in the forgotten lands. A people to whom the progress of our civilization is one with the ages past. For whom there is again the slow, toiling road toward the light. And somewhere, perhaps, a conquering race. The most brutal and callous of mankind. Rioting in their sense of power, and dragging themselves down to oblivion. His gaze came slowly back to the room and the figure of the man still fighting for his dream. They would not, said Avery hoarsely. They'd use it for good. Would they? asked Professor Edinger. He spoke simply as one stating simple facts. I love my fellow men, he said, and I killed them in thousands in the last war. I and my science and my poison gas. The figure of Avery slumped suddenly upon a chair. His face was buried in his hands. And I would have been, he groaned, the greatest man in the world. You shall be greater, said the professor, though only we shall know it. You and I, you will save the world from itself. The figure, bowed and sunken in the chair, made no move. The man was heedless of the kindly hand upon his shoulder. His voice, when he spoke, was that of one afar off speaking out of a great loneliness. "'You don't understand,' he said dully. "'You can't.' But Professor Edinger, a cog in the wheels of a great educational machine, glanced at the watch on his wrist. 
Again his thin shoulders were stooped, his voice tired. My classes, he said. I must be going. In the gathering dusk, Professor Edinger locked carefully the door of his office. He crossed beyond his desk and fumbled with his one hand for his keys. There was a cabinet to be opened, and he stared long in the dim light at the object he withdrew. He looked approvingly at the exquisite workmanship of an instrument where a generator of the cathode ray and an intricate maze of tubings surmounted electromagnets and a round lead bulb. There were terminals for attaching heavy cables. It was a beautiful thing. His useless arm moved to bring an imaginary hand before the window of quartz in the lead sphere. Power, he whispered and repeated Avery's words. Power to build a city or destroy a civilization. And I hold it in one hand. He replaced the apparatus in the safety of its case. The saviors of mankind, he said, and his tone was harsh and bitter. But a smile, whimsical, kindly, crinkled his tired eyes as he turned to his desk and its usual litter of examination papers. It is something, Avery, he whispered to that distant man, to belong in so distinguished a group. End of section 17. Recording by Robert Dixon. End of Astounding Stories, 7 July 1930, by Various.